السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله اوكي شلومك السادس ان شاء الله ان الحمد لله نستعين به ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شر انفسنا ومسيئات اعمالنا Uh, all praises to Allah, we praise Him, seek refuge in Him, we ask Allah's guidance and forgiveness. We respect brother and sister, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of your prayers and your fasting. Allahumma ameen. Uh, following the series, we've started with, uh, from the beginning of Ramadan with uh, brother Andrew, inshallah, covering some topics from Ihya Ulum al-Din for Sheikh Abi Hamid al-Ghazali. And inshallah, today with the second session, titled with uh, Repentance, Fear, Uh, and hope, inshallah. Uh, so I'm going to leave it now for uh, Brother Andrew, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from what we're going to hear. Allahumma ameen. Okay, Brother Andrew. Ameen, ameen. Jazakum Allah khairan, Brother Sami. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Thank you again for uh, this time together in this blessed month where we can reflect upon ourselves, our reality, our relationship with our Lord. And today is a session which centers on some very crucial topics. Um, it's daunting in one sense uh, and, and a, a great eye opener when you look at the insights that the various sheikhs that we're going to quote from have brought uh, and the discussions that they brought forth. So today's subject will be on repentance, fear and hope. Now these are essentially books 31 and 33 of the Ihya by uh, Ghazali. But before throwing ourselves into Ghazali's discussions, we should first discuss the concept of sin. So in terms of defining sin, let's start with the Quran 7.33, where Allah says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Qul inna ma harrama rabbi al-fawahisha ma zahara minha wa ma batana wal-ithma wal-baghiya bi ghayri al-haqri wa an tushriku billahi ma lam yunazzil bihi sultana ما لم ينزل به سلطانا وأن تقولوا على الله ما لا تعلمون Say, O Prophet, my Lord only forbids disgraceful deeds, fawahish, whether they be open, ظهر, or hidden, button, and sin, ithm, and unjustified aggression, and that you, without his sanction, associate things with him and that you say things about him, God, without knowledge. Therefore, knowing what a sin is requires a certain level of knowledge of the sacred law, the Sharia. The division of outward and inward sins can refer to sins done publicly and privately, respectively, or to outward action and inward intention respectively. In addition, sins of the limbs can be divided into two essential categories on a reading of Quran 431, where Allah says, <laughs> But if you, you avoid the great sins, Kabair, you have been forbidden, we shall wipe out your minor misdeeds, Sayyat, and let you in through the entrance of honor. So the actual distinction between Kabair and sayyat between major sins and small sins is not set out in the Quran. Although there's a whole scholarly discussion about which sins fall into which category. And Imam Ghazali in his Ihya in the book of Tawbah, in the book of Repentance, goes into the scholarly discussion, which we won't touch on today. For our purposes, perhaps the most helpful way that we can maintain an understanding of the concept is from Ibn Abbas 
radiallahu anhu, quoted in Tafsir al-Tabri, where he says, La kibarata mastighfar wa la saghirata ma'a israr. Okay, so there is no major sin if one seeks forgiveness, and there is no minor sin if one persists in committing it. And with regards to the inward sin of intention, let me quote a powerful and comprehensive hadith recorded by Tirmidhi in his Sunan, which he classed as good and authentic, Hassan Sahih, where Abu Kabsha reported that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily, the world has only four kinds of people. Firstly, there is one whom God has granted wealth and knowledge, so he fears his Lord in them, upholds family ties, and fulfills the rights of Allah over him. He is in the best position. Secondly, there is one whom Allah has granted knowledge without wealth. He, he has a sincere intention, and he says, if I had wealth, I would have acted like this first person. If that is his intention, he will have the same reward as the first person. Thirdly, there is one whom Allah has granted wealth without knowledge. He squanders his wealth in ignorance, he does not fear Allah in it, he does not fulfill the duties to his family, and he does not fulfill the rights of Allah over him. He will be in the worst position. Fourthly, there is one whom Allah has granted neither knowledge nor wealth, and he says, if I had wealth, I would have acted like the third person. If that is his intention, he will have the same sin as that third person. Now, let us touch on the condemnation of sin. Sheikh Abdel Fattah Abu Ghudda has compiled some very beneficial notes in his edition of Al Muhasibi's Risalat Al Mustarshideen. And English readers can read Muhammad Muhammadi's translation for Zamzam publishers. On the effects of abstaining from sins, he quotes a lengthy passage from Ibn Qayyim's Fawaid and Al Jawab al Kafi. I will read from it now, and I will say what Abu Ghudda said when he presented the passage. He said, excuse me for going into such length in this matter, for sin is one of the greatest ills in our efforts towards salvation. We are weak. We sin a great deal and disobey a great deal. We are therefore fully in need of, of admonition. Perhaps we will abstain from sins and repent before the knower of the unseen. So he, quoting Ibn Qayyim, first from the Fawaid, Ibn Qayyim says, in regards to a person who sins, he says, sins are actual injuries. At times, injuries cause death. A person has not been beaten by a punishment that is more severe than hard-heartedness and being distant, distanced from Allah. When the heart becomes hard, the eyes become dry, meaning people stop crying and they have, they have, they have leave soft heartedness. You should know that exercising patience, sabr, in abstaining from desire, hawa, is easier than exercising patience over the consequences of desire. Desire either imposes pain and punishment, severs pun pleasure better than it, causes the wasting of time which results in remorse and regret, injures one's honor whose fulfillment is better than its injury. It takes away a bounty whose presence is more enjoyable and more wholesome than the fulfillment of desire. It attracts worry, sorrow, grief, and fear, which are far in excess of the enjoyment of desires. It causes knowledge to be forgotten, whose remembrance is far more in enjoyable than the fulfillment of desire. It causes your enemy to, to rejoice over your affliction and your friend to worry over you. It severs the path for a bounty that was heading towards you, or it causes a defect in you, which then becomes an inseparable attribute in you. This is because deeds cause attributes and mannerisms. Were it not for the fact that the abandonment of sins and acts of disobedience causes one to, uh, causes the maintenance of one's self-respect, it would be enough. Because if one leaves sins, it protects one's wealth. It gives comfort to the body. 
welfare to the soul, pleasure to the heart, expansion of the chest, decrease in worries, concern and grief, protection of the light of the heart from being extinguished by the darkness of sin. Ease in sustenance for him from avenues he did not even imagine, ease in those matters that are difficult on those engrossed in disobedience and sins, ease in doing good deeds, ease in acquiring knowledge, praise for him from people, supplications in his favour from others, sweetness that his face earns, or for him in the hearts of people, they're coming to his defence and assistance when he is harmed and wronged, they're defending his honour when any slanderer slanders him. The speed with which his supplication are accepted, the removal of estrangement that exists between him and Allah, the proximity of angels to him, the distance of Satan from among man and jinn from him, people competing with each other to serve him and fulfill his needs, their courtship in order to win his love and companionship, the absence of his fear for death. In fact, he rejoices at its approach because he is going to his sustainer. He is going to meet him and travel towards him. The paltriness of the world in his eyes, the grandeur of the hereafter in his eyes, his extreme desire for the grand kingdom and supreme triumph in the hereafter emerge in his heart. Tasting the sweetness of obedience, experiencing the sweetness of faith, Iman, the supplication of the bearers of the Arsh, throne of God, and the angels that are around it, the happiness of the scribes that record his deeds with him, their supplication in his favour all the time, increase in his intelligence, understanding, iman and cognition, acquiring the love of Allah for him, his turning towards him and his joy at his repentance. All these ought to be sufficient to prompt a person to abandon sins and acts of disobedience. In this way, Allah recompenses a person with joy and happiness, which are far beyond the joy and happiness they experience when they commit a sin. These are some of the effects of abandoning sins in this world. When he passes away, the angels meet him by giving him the glad tidings of paradise from his sustainer, and that he has no cause to fear nor any reason to grieve. He is thus transferred from the prison and confinement of this world to one of the gardens of paradise enjoying himself there until the day of resurrection. When the day of resurrection takes place, people will be in intense heat and perspiration while he will be in the shade of the Arsh. And then Ibn al-Qayyim is quoted by Sheikh Abu Ghudda as talking about the effects of sins. And this is from his Al-Jawab al-Kafi. He says, sins have horrible, revolting and harmful effects on the heart and the body in this world and in the hereafter. It's only Allah who knows the true effects of sins. Some of them are deprivation of knowledge and sustenance, alienation and estrangement between the sinner and Allah and between the sinner and the people, difficulty in all his matters, darkness of the heart, face and grave, weakness of the heart and body, deprivation of the ability to obey, destruction of the person's life that these difficulties give rise to other similar difficulties, and these in turn to others. Sins weaken the will of the heart and its ability to turn to Allah, and considering evils to be evils disappears from the heart. Sins are also a cause of a person becoming despicable and contemptible before Allah. They corrupt the intellect. The heart becomes sealed. They include a person under the curse of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they deprive him from being included in the supplications of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the supplications of the angels in favor of those who obey the commands of Allah and follow the book of Allah and the Sunnah of his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sins are a cause of all the different punishments in the grave. They cause various types of destruction on earth. They, in they invite Allah's forgetting such a person and here is the real destruction. They remove man from the circle of kindness and deprive him of the reward of the righteous. They obliterate bounties and favors. They cause torments to descend. They cause the person to become fearful and terrified. The heart that was alive and healthy, 
becomes sick and dead. It causes the insight to become blind. The sinner remains a prisoner of shaitan, a prisoner of his soul that commands him to do evil. It confines him to the prison of desires and lusts. It causes him to fall from his position and status. It snatches away praiseworthy names from him. It earns him blameworthy names. It obliterates the blessings of knowledge, deeds, sustenance, life, and everything else. It abandons a, a, a person at the time when he is most in need. It causes his protector from the angels to distance from him. It causes his enemies from shaitan to get closer to him. It causes ill effects in the heart to be overcome by passion, to become sealed and shut, hypocrisy and evil traits to accept doubts and misgivings and other deadly illnesses. In short, all the evils of the world and the hereafter, which are on the hearts and the bodies, the general ones and the specific ones, the causes of all are sins and acts of disobedience. And Allah is our refuge. And then he, can, and then he also adds a saying from one of his colleagues, Sheikh Mustafa al-Sibari, when he said, when your soul is determined to commit a sin, remind it of Allah. If it does not desist, remind it of the character of true men. If it does not desist, remind it of the humiliation and disgrace that will follow if people come to know of it. If he does not desist still, you should know that you have turned into an animal at that time. And Allah is our refuge from that. So we see that the consequences of sins are not just in the next world, but also now. And they're not just in relation to reward, but they also can lead to th uh, the deprivation of your intellect and, and they can bring about uh, trauma, mental trauma, as well as tribulations in this world. Now, returning to the Ahya and Kitab at Tawbah, which is book 31. So here, Ghazali mentions that know that, ab that the obligatoriness of repentance is clear from the many prophetic traditions and Quranic verses. He mentions if you look at the book of, book of Allah, Allah says, and turn all together to all together to God, O you believers, happily so you will prosper. And believers turn to God in sincere repentance. Tawbah Nusuh. The merit of repentance is inferred also from the saying of Allah truly, God loves those who repent and He loves those who cleanse themselves. Allah's Messenger وسلم, in a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim said, Allah is more happy with the repentance of a believing servant than a man who comes to a perilous deserted land with his mount carrying food and drink and puts his head down and sleeps for a while. When he wakes up, he finds that his mount is gone. He looks for it, but when the heat and thirst intensify, he says to himself, I will go back to where I was first and sleep there until I die. And so he puts his head on his arm to die. But when he wakes up again, he finds his mount carrying his food and drink, standing right there. Allah is more happy with the repentance of the believing servant than this man is with seeing his mount. And Ghazali adds, it cannot be doubted that repentance is obligatory instantly. For to know that sins are destructive is part of faith and faith is obligated instantly. The knowledge of the harmfulness of sins is only required in order for it to be an incentive to leave them. He who does not abstain from sins lacks this part of faith. And this is what is meant by the saying of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bukhari and Muslim, the fornicator does not fornicate and still remain a believer at that moment when he is fornicating. The faith in question in this hadith is not the faith relating to God's attributes or oneness, the latter are not negated by fornication or transgressions. Rather, faith is negated in this prophetic tradition because fornication sets one afar from Allah and incurs Allah's detestation. Moreover, faith is not just one single category, but 
rather 70 odd categories, the highest of which is the testification that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, and the lowest of which is removing harmful stuff from the street, as mentioned in the Hadith in Muslim. A human being cannot conceivably be free from deficiencies, but people differ in the extent of it, even while the deficiency itself remains inevitable. It is for this reason that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, my heart gets overshadowed whereby I seek forgiveness from Allah 70 times in a day and night. And this is why Allah said in, in honoring him that God may forgive thee thy former and thy latter sins. If this is the case with the Prophet وسلم, then how is it with others and ourselves? Know also that it has already been mentioned that due to man's constitution, he is not immune from following desires. Repentance does not mean merely leaving desires behind. Complete repentance also requires making up that which has passed. Every time man follows the desire, darkness rises to his heart, just as dimness rises from man's breath to a polished mirror. When the darkness of desires accumulates, it turns into rust in the same way that the accumulation of the vapor of breathing on a mirror turns into dirt. As Allah says, no indeed, but that which they were earning has rusted upon their hearts. Thus, it is not sufficient to redress one's following of desires in the past by simply departing from them in the future. Rather, one should also erase the rust imprinted on the heart. It is to this that Allah's Messenger وسلم, points in a hadith in Tirmidhi, follow a bad deed with a good one, you will erase it. And it is also to this that Allah points when he says, but God will never defer any soul when its turn comes. God shall turn only towards those who do evil in ignorance, then shortly repent. God will indeed return towards Towards those, Allah is all knowing, all wise. But God shall not turn towards those who do evil deeds until when one of them is visited by death, he says, Indeed, now I, I repent. And then, with regards to a tawbah as sahiha and the a valid repentance, Imam Nawi, uh, just departing from the Ihya, I think Imam Nawi in the Riyadh al Salihin, he has a very succinct. Uh, outline of the conditions, shurut of tawbah, where he says, if the sin is between the servant and Allah, unrelated to a human being, then it has three conditions. First, to stop committing it. Second, to feel regret uh, for committing it. Third, to be determined not to commit it again. If any one of these three are missing, one's repentance is not sound. However, he says, if the offense is related to a human being, then it has four conditions. Those three conditions previously mentioned, and then uh, satisfying the right of the other person that has been abused. So if it involves property, you restore that property to the person. Ghazali, returning to Ghazali, he then says, any repentance which fulfills all its conditions is accepted for the light of good deeds effaces the darkness of sin from the surface of the heart and the darkness of transgression is helpless before the light of good deeds just as the darkness of the night is before daylight all that one has to do is cleanse and purify oneself and the acceptance is already granted the unavoidable pre-eternal decree being foregone and this is what is referred to as prosperity. In the saying of Allah, prosperous is he who purifies it, his soul. He who imagines that valid repentance cannot be accepted is like him who thinks that the sun can rise without darkness being dissipated. Now looking at the categories of sin in relation to the servant. Ghazali says, know that sins are divided into those which are a matter between the servant and Allah and those which relate to the rights of the servants, as we mentioned before from Noah. 
those sins which are strictly a matter between the servant and Allah, such as not praying or fasting or ignoring the obligations that relate to him and anything that does not entail shirk, association with partners of Allah, pardon regarding these is closer and more hopeful. But the matter is harder with everything that concerns the rights of the servants, other people, such as one's failing to pay zakat, because as the ulama say, zakat is not charity. It's not something you do voluntarily. It's the haq, it's the right of the poor. So when you don't pay zakat, you're withholding the wealth that is the right of those people. Likewise, killing a human being, taking another person's wealth, reviling their honor or anything that takes from others' rights, whether it relates to someone's person, wealth, honor, debt, position, or to calling to blameworthy innovations, bid'ah, encouraging sins or inciting the causes for opposing Allah, as is done by some preachers. Hu Ghazali says, give, hope, give precedence to hope over fear. And we'll return to that in a minute. He adds, wishing to delimit major sins or to set a comprehensive exclusive number for them is wanting the impossible. For it is impossible to do so unless there exists an oral report from Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and there isn't one. So therefore these various lists that you'll find of these are the Kabair and these are the Sayyat, these are not set in stone. How then can anyone enumerate that which the sacred law has not enumerated? The sacred law may not have disclosed the number of major sins in order that the servants should be afraid of engaging in them just as it did not specify the exact timing of the night of destiny, Laylatul Qadr, so that people would strive hard to attain it and to reach it. He then has a little section on the reasons that turn minor sins into major sins. One is if one persists and perseveres in them. Two, if one belittles the sin that one commits. So a scholar might tell you, oh, that's a small sin. And therefore you think in your mind it's unimportant, but that can then make it big due to your, your, your belittling of it. Another reason could be happiness, rejoicing and bragging about minor sins. Now, another one is indifference towards Allah's concealment of the sinner's transgressions and towards Allah's grant of respite, unaware that Allah is giving him respite out of detestation in order for him to engage in more sins, while he believes his ability to sin is due to Allah's concern for him. Such a state of affairs results only from his sense of feeling safe from Allah's devising and to his ignorance of the hidden traps of conceitedness vis-a-vis -vis Allah. Allah says, and they say to themselves, why does God not chastise us for what we say? Sufficient for them is hell, Jahannam, at which they shall be roasted and evil homecoming. Another reason is when a man of knowledge commits a minor sin but is emulated by people. The Prophet وسلم, said, whoever imitates an evil practice shall bear its burden and the burdens of all those who do it without diminishing anything from their own burdens in Sahih Muslim. Allah says, and write down what they have forwarded and what they have left behind. Ghazali says, what they have left behind are the works that will join the doer after his passing and after the cessation of his work. Now, looking at the completeness, conditions, and perpetu uh, perpetuity of repentance, Tamam at Tawbah wa Shurutuha. He says, as for regret, nadam, it is pain that the heart suffers when it, feels that it, when it feels that it has missed the beloved. The signs of regret include grief, sadness, weeping, and reflection. The expiation of sins is hoped for in the proportion to the severity of the pain suffered from regret. One of the signs of regret is that the bitterness of those sins rather than their sweetness, becomes firm in the person's heart. 
Thus, he substitutes his inclination towards these sins with dislike and his desire for them with repulsion. These are the conditions of the completeness of regret, and they should last until death. One should feel the bitterness described above in all transgressions, even if one has not committed them previously. And then he looks at the categories of people regarding completeness of repentance. The first category, this is where the sinner repents and holds fast to repentance until the end of his life. He redresses what he neglected in the past and never contemplates going back to his past transgressions, except of course for the lapses that no human being is immune from. This is holding fast to repentance and such a repentance is an, and such a repentant is an outstripper in good works and one who changes his evil deeds with good ones. The name of such repentance is sincere repentance, a tawba and nasuha. And the name of this calm soul is the tranquil self, a nafs al mutma'inna, which is mentioned in the Quran in 8927, which will be the one that returns to its Lord well pleased, radiatan, and well pleasing, maradiyatan. Again, this is referenced in 8928. The second category, the person who um, the person who, who repents and then follows the path of rectitude regarding the main acts of disobedience, abandons all major sins and indecencies, but is not immune from falling into some sins, not intentionally or purposefully, but because he is afflicted by them in the course of things. However, whenever he engages in sin, he reproaches himself, regrets it, feels sorry, and renews his determination to avoid the causes that exposed him to it. Such a soul deserves to be the reproachful soul. And nafs al described in Quran 75 2. For it reproaches the person for unintentionally falling into blameworthy states. This is also a lofty rank, Ghazali says, even if, even if it is below the first category. This category includes most types of repentant people. The aim is that the repentance goodness overcomes his evil in order that the scale of good deeds outweighs the balance. For it is extremely unlikely that the scale of bad deeds be complete completely empty. Allah the Exalted has given a good promise to those who fall into this category. The third category. The person repents, continues on the path of rectitude for a while, but then his desires overcome him with regard to some sins, and this leads him to intentionally engage in them due to his inability to subdue his desires. In spite of this, this person is diligent in acts of obedience and abstains from many sins, even though he has a desire for them and the ability to engage in them. His only plight is that he is overcome by one or two desires, while hoping that Allah will enable him to subdue them and to suffice him of their evil. Such is his hope. Upon fulfilling his desire and after fulfilling it, he feels regret and says, I wish I did not do it. I shall repent from it and struggle against my soul. But he keeps postponing his repentance time and again. Such a soul is called the luring soul, a nafs al musawwala. And Allah says about the person who is thus, and others have confessed their sins, they have mixed a righteous deed with another evil. There is hope for such a person if he is diligent in acts of obedience and dislikes the sins he falls into. Perhaps Allah will accept his repentance. However, his consequence can be dangerous insofar as he keeps deferring and postponing his repentance for he could die before doing so it is feared that he might have a bad end and in the fourth category the person repents and holds fast to rectitude for a while but then returns to sinning without even thinking of repenting or feeling sorry for his acts such a person is among those who persist in sin and his soul is the soul that incites to evil and nafs al amara bisu, the soul that incites to evil, mentioned in the Quran in 1253, and that flees from goodness. 
It is feared that such a person may have a bad end. However, his matter is according to Allah's will. If he ends his life as an unbeliever, he will be wretched for eternity. If the end of his life is a happy one, this person will die professing Tawheed, divine oneness, and will be expected to be saved from hellfire, even if it is only after a while. And what a person does after sinning, Ghazali discusses. The person who commits a sin must hasten to repent and regret his act and engage in expiating his sin with a countering good deed. If his soul does not aid him in, resol in resolving to abandon the sin due to the overwhelmingness of desire, then he has, he has failed to perform one specific obligation. Let him therefore not leave the, the other obligation, namely doing a good deed to efface the evil one. By doing so, he will be among those who mixed a good deed with a bad deed. The good deeds that expiate evil deeds can be either with the heart, the tongue, or the limbs. The countering good deed should replace the bad one and also that which relates to its causes. The expiation of the heart is imploring Allah and asking him for forgiveness and pardon. The expiation of the tongue is by acknowledging one's wrongdoing and seeking forgiveness for that. One should say, O oh Lord, I have wronged myself and committed evil, so please forgive my sins. The expiation of the limbs is by performing acts of obedience, giving charity and other types of worship. And Ghazali says, never belittle how small acts of obedience are which may lead you to abstain from them, nor very small transgressions, which may lead you to not avoid them. Imploring Allah and seeking forgiveness with one's heart is a good deed that shall be found with Allah. And then Ghazali talks about how one can cure this problem of sinning. He says the only reasons for persisting in sin are heedlessness and lust. Heedlessness, ghafla, is only countered by knowledge, ilm, while lust, hawa, is only countered by patience, sabr, and excising, removing the causes which arouse it. Now here he only deals in this book of Toba with the knowledge side of it because he has another book, book 32, that's all on patience, sabr, which relates the second cure. Now, relating to the types of treatment which are beneficial in untying the knots of persistence and in driving people to abandon sins, he says there are four. The first is to mention the Quranic versage which, which frightened the sinners and transgressors, as well as the prophetic hadith and sayings of the Salaf predecessors, which dispraise sinners and praise the repentant, and these are abundant. Then the second is to relate the stories of the prophets and righteous predecessors and the calamities that befell them because of their sins, such as the disobedience of Adam salam, and his consequent expulsion from paradise, Hazali says. This has a great impact and is of an evident benefit to the hearts of people. The likes of these stories are innumerable and the Quran does not mention them for nightly discussions, meaning there's a reason why all these stories are in the Quran. The third, cat, the third type of, of healing is to tell the sinners that it is probable that their punishment is hastened in this world and that all the calamities that befall the servant are the result of his crimes. Many a servant is slack about the matter of the afterlife due to his extreme ignorance, but afraid of Allah's punishment in this world. The fourth doesn't apply to us now, but is to mention the legal punishments, hudud, relating to individual transgressions such as drinking wine, fornication, theft, haughtiness, and rancor. And then Ghazali talks about the abundance of the sicknesses of the heart. And it's the sick, it's the sick heart, of course, now the billah that sins. And so he talks about kafra, uh, kafra the abundance of the sicknesses of the heart. He says, the disease of hearts has become more frequent than the disease of bodies due to three reasons. And remember, he's writing a thousand years ago. The first, the first 
is because the sick heart does not know that it is sick. The second is because the consequences of the sickness of the heart is not seen in this world in contrast to the sickness of the body. The consequence of the latter is death, which is observed by all and people's natures are repelled by death. While that which is after death is not seen, the consequence of sins is the death of the heart, which is not seen in this world. And this is why there is little repulsion from sins, even when these are known by the transgressors. And then the third, which is the greatest cause, he says, is the lack of physicians, of tibba. The latter are the men of knowledge, ulama, and they have in these times become seriously sick themselves and have failed to treat themselves for their spiritual illnesses. He says, in fact, the physicians, the ulama, have engaged in all sorts of misleading practices. And finally, he says, no, that's, that falling into sin is not due to lack of faith, but rather to its weakness. For every believer confirms that transgression is a cause of distance from Allah and a reason for chastisement in the afterlife. However, there are two reasons for the believers falling into sin. The first is due to the fact that the punishment promised for those who sin is not immediate but unseen and the soul is predisposed to be affected by what is immediate. The effect of that which is promised is weaker in relation to the effect of that which is present. The second is that desires that drive sinning are in themselves exacting and overwhelming at the moment of their arousal. They become too strong and thus overpower the soul through habit and usage. But then indeed Allah says, no indeed, but you love the hasty world and leave be the, and leave the, uh, the uh, hereafter. And Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has described the severity of this matter when he said, paradise is surrounded with loathsome things and hellfire is surrounded with desires, Bukhari and Muslim. The third cause is that in most cases, there are not a single believing sinner who does not intend to repent and expiate his bad deeds with good ones, since he has promised that this should redress his past transgressions. Nonetheless, long held hope predominates human nature and this is why he keeps postponing his repentance and expiation of sins. The fourth is that every believing person believes that sins do affirmatively imply punishment which cannot be pardoned. In this way, he sins and expects pardon out of reliance on the bounty of Allah. And so with regards to these four, there are, there are cures to them. He would say in relation to the first one, a person must acknowledge that everything that is forthcoming is coming soon, that tomorrow for those waiting is near and that death is closer to each person than his shoelaces. He does not know whether the hour is close. He should remind himself that with regard to the worldly matters, he always exhausts himself in the immediate time out of fear of what might profit or what might happen in the future. Thus he journeys by sea and bears the hardships of travel for profit, which he thinks might be needed later. As for postponing repentance, this is cured by reflecting upon the fact that most of the shrieking of the people of hellfire is due to procrastinations. And with regards to the fourth reason, which is expecting Allah's pardon, it is like a person who spends all his wealth and leaves himself and his family poor while expecting that Allah will enable him to find treasure in a wasteland. <coughs> Such a person expects something which is, which is quite possible, but he is an extreme fool and an ignoramus. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. <clears throat> and, then, <clears throat> and then maybe trying to <clears throat> briefly look at fear and hope and khawf and Raja. <clears throat> Actually, it might be a bit. <clears throat> it might be a bit of a big topic, I think, to cover 
in a few minutes. I think repentance, the book of repentance has so much going on. That may be where we pause there and we cover fear and hope, inshallah, next time. If that's okay. And if anyone has any reflections or contributions, that'd be welcome, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan with Andrew for this part today. Why, uh, uh, sure. If any of the brothers has any contribution and a question, inshallah, please raise your hand and go for it. Brothers who are out watching on Facebook as well, if you've got any question, just to put it in the comments, inshallah, I'll, I'll, I'll see it. I have been looking. Okay, brothers, if uh, there are no questions for today, inshallah, inshallah, we'll end with dua and we'll finish, inshallah, with uh, Brother Andrew for the second session today. I'm going to continue, inshallah, next Sunday at the same time, 6 o'clock, inshallah. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين اللهم تقبل منا صيامنا وصلاتنا وسجودنا وصالح أعمالنا اللهم اصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا آخرتنا التي إليها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر اللهم اجعلنا من عتقائك من النار ومن المرحومين اللهم اجعل القرآن الكريم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء همومنا وأحزاننا اللهم ذكرنا منه ما نسينا وعلمنا منه ما جهلنا وارزقنا تلاوته آناء الليل وأطراف النهار على الوجه الذي يرضيك عنا يا رب العالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين لكم الله خير برضا أندر for this official reminder من الله سبحانه وتعالى in your past, uh, inshallah, on the day of judgment, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, brothers, for joining today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your prayers and your fasting, inshallah. See you next Sunday at the same time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.